Thank you for attending this afternoon, and we will be talking about TNS poisoning attacks in the Oracle database. My name is Steve Coast. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Integrity, and we'll be walking through a fairly old security vulnerability within the Oracle database today, but talking about how it's still very relevant in many or organizations uh, and their Oracle databases. Before we get started, a little background about Integrity real quick. Integrity specializes in Oracle database security and Oracle eBusiness Suite security. And that's, we spend a lot of time working with our clients on helping them protect their Oracle database environments. And that's why we have identified this specific vulnerability quite often. And that's why we want to do a special webinar on it to really ra raise awareness and talk about how to, to detect it in your environment, what are some of the issues, and how to defend against it. Uh, before we get started, though, quick background about Integrity. We do have two service lines. We do have a set of products that we sell uh, related to Oracle ERP and Oracle database security. The first being AppSentry, which is a security auditing tool, which will detect if you do have this vulnerability in your environment today. And then also for any eBusiness Suite customers on the call today, uh, we do have a web application firewall that's specifically designed for Oracle eBusiness Suite. And then the second side of Integrity's business is doing security assessments and other services, helping large organizations with compliance requirements such as Sarbanes-Oxley, PCI, HIPAA, helping them design and secure their ERP and database environments, implementing products like Imperva, Guardium, Oracle Audit Vault, Oracle Database Vault, Oracle Transparent Data Encryption. So enough about Integrity. Uh, we can get started and start talking about some of the issues with the TNS poisoning vulnerability. So before we get started, let's talk about why are we discussing an Oracle database security vulnerability that was reported to Oracle in 2008. The primary reason is we're still finding this vulnerability today in many environments. In 2016, we kind of go through all our security assessments and <clears throat> anonymize the data and kind of do some statistics. This is one of the vulnerabilities besides default passwords and missing security patches that pops up very often in a lot of our security assessments. So going through about a couple hundred security assessments that Integrity's performed in 2016, we found this vulnerability in approximately 60% of the databases we assessed. That is a fairly large number. We find default passwords in between 70 and 80% missing security patches and only about 40 to 50% of the databases we review. So this is a very high number. And so this is one of those vulnerabilities that is kind of slipping through the cracks that was not fixed by a security patch and is not enabled by default. So any database 11.204 and prior is not fixed by default, is not enabled by default, and also does not have a CPU. This is a manual fix that must be implemented for any 11.204 and prior database. Given this, we actually find this also in 12C databases where it is fixed and it's enabled by default, but you can actually disable this feature and make your database vulnerable, and we'll talk about that later. So again, this is a, a major issue for a lot of databases, and it's a very critical vulnerability. And we'll go through and discuss in great detail how it works, why it works, and things like that. But again, this is in a lot of databases, and a lot of the people on the call today have probably one or more databases in their organization that are vulnerable to this. So a little background about the vulnerability before we talk about it. Uh, this is a little soap opera-ish, uh, but it kind of gives you an idea about classic vulnerabilities working with Oracle security on how to get a vulnerability fixed, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, things like that. Um, so a security researcher out of Spain, uh, Joaxin Corre, reported this bug to Oracle in 2008. Not until 2012, so four years later, did actually Oracle get around to doing something about it. And this was primarily because it's a fairly significant flaw in the way a key process works within the Oracle database, and it took a long time. Oracle is now doing much better in fixing security vulnerabilities typically within 90 to 180 days. But again, some vulnerabilities stick out there for a number of years. Integrity, we're a security researcher also, report a lot of security vulnerabilities to Oracle. And when I hear that a vulnerability may have taken four years to fix, we have some that are six years old within the Oracle Business Suite. So this is not uncommon, especially for ones that require a major change behind the scenes in the database. So Joe Axon reported this to Oracle in 2008. And based on some miscommunication between the security researcher and Oracle, 
Joaxin believed this was actually fixed in the April 2012 CPU. This is where now the little soap opera comes. So believing it was fixed, he had a very nice white paper that he wrote out detailing out everything about the security bug and how to exploit it, why it happens, and potential ways to fix it. And so he actually released that as part of the April 2012 CPU on April 17th. Uh, he published out his white paper that detailed out how to actually exploit this bug. Unfortunately, Oracle did not fix the bug in the April 2012 CPU. They were waiting until 11.204 and 12C actually came out to actually implement this fix and were looking for ways to actually backport that fix or have workarounds in previous versions. So Oracle actually scrambled then for a couple of weeks and actually came up with a document and an advisory and they did a one-off database security advisory, which is very unusual for Oracle. Um, there's only been one or two of those over t th since 2005 when Oracle started doing the critical patch updates that a security advisory for the Oracle database came out that was not part of a CPU. So on April 30th, 2012, Oracle actually released some workarounds for 11.203 and prior versions of the database because that's what was available at that date on how to fix this bug. And again, this was not a patch. So Oracle released an advisory that had only workarounds. There is no patch for this vulnerability until we start talking about 20, until we talk about 12C. Then on June 20th, 2014, Oracle actually updated the advisory eight months after the release of 11.204 because it became very apparent that it was not actually fixed by default in 11.204 and many 11.204 versions were vulnerable, or implementations were vulnerable to this. So 11.204 was out for eight months. Metalink notes were actually wrong about this. They said, oh yeah, 11.204 is fixed by default, and it was not fixed by default. So 11.204 is also vulnerable to this vulnerability. Uh, when 12.101 and 12.102 got released, they are both fixed by default, but 11.204 is not, even though some of the early Metalink notes um, when and after the immediate release of 11.204 in 2013 said it was actually fixed. So now it's 2016 and we're still talking about this and the reason we're talking about this is because this is a workaround for most versions 11.204 and prior and only in 12c is it fixed by default. Um, and that's why we're talking about it because we're finding this quite often in client environments and it's not the easiest thing to look for or fix. Um, that it does require a couple manual steps and which we'll talk about. So enough about the timeline and the soap opera regarding this vulnerability. Let's talk about a little background first about what's happening. Why is this actually in the database? Why is it, quote, a feature? So the Oracle database does have database listener registration. And this is a feature within the database. And listener registration allows the database to actually talk to the listener and dynamically register itself. Uh, prior Early, much earlier versions of the Oracle database, you actually had to go do the listener or a file and actually put in the static entries to tell it what databases were connecting to it. Listener registration allowed that process to ha happen dynamically. It's actually possible not even to have a listener.ora file that if you just start up the listener, it'll automatically start as the name listener and start on 1521. The database will automatically find that. Everything works really well. Um, this works especially well in local registration. So again, I can put in static service entries in the listener.ora file, but if I just put in a default configuration or I set some initialization parameters, specifically local listener, I can automatically have the Oracle database register with a listener and then we'll pick it up. I don't have to put those static entries in the listener.ora. So anyone who's been working with Oracle with 7i or version 7 and 8i, remember having to put those static entries in. Again, local reg listener registration is what <clears throat> overcame that and allowed you to re reg register dynamically. Where this vulnerability now starts to kick in is now with the introduction of Rack in 8i, well, now I've got multiple databases running on different database servers that need to communicate, need to load, balance, and share. So when I'm working in a cluster, the Oracle database loves to share connections. It loves to be in a clustered environment, share its workload. And the feature is remote registration. So different databases can connect to different listeners and register themselves to say, oh, hey, I'm actually part of this database cluster and give me some of the traffic. As you're now thinking, hey, I wonder, yeah, that could be a problem. And this is fundamentally what the problem is. This remote registration is broken because there's no authentication. Anybody can connect and say, hey, I'm a database. 
So let's now start specifically talking about the TNS poisoning attack flaw. Again, this is a one-off advisory that was released April 30th, 2012. So again, we're talking about over four years ago, and we're still talking about this vulnerability. Even though it was found and reported to Oracle in 2008, it was actually fixed in 2012. And this is the actual chart from the CP from the advisory. And the reason I like to talk about these is to give you more familiarity with what the advisory is, what are some of the key elements within the advisory, and what should you be looking at when you're looking at each CPU and some of the values in these columns, because they do become important and it at least gives you some flavor and idea of what's happening with each vulnerability. So the first number in the upper left hand corner is the CVEID. So for this vulnerability, especially because it got a lot of press, you can actually take that CVEID and actually type that into Google and you'll actually get a lot of references, a lot of additional information, a lot of blog posts, people who have actually looked at this, spent some time typing up some nice papers out there. There's actually a lot of information out there. Um, the next ones are component. Again, this is in the listener. This is a flaw within the network listener. Um, and the protocol is Oracle Net, so SQL Net. So I basically have to be able to connect to the Oracle listener using the SQL Net protocol. The next value is remotely exploitable without authentication. And again, I'm trying to highlight some of these key columns within this so you can get a flavor for what some of these advisories say and don't say. Remotely exploitable without authentication is meaning that I can actually connect to the database port to the listener and I can do something and attack the database without actually having a database session. I don't have to log in. Why this is critical in this vulnerability is since 2005, there's only been two security vulnerabilities for the Oracle database that were remotely exploitable without authentication that could actually do something and take over the database. The other one is a flaw with the way the uh, I could actually potentially attack passwords without actually having to log in the database. This one I can actually compromise the database without having to log in. Every single Oracle database security vulnerability except for those, this one and another one require me to log into the database. Once I'm in the database I can very much take it over very easily with public permissions and a lot of security vulnerabilities with Oracle. But the Oracle database is fairly secure. If I can't log into the database it's usually very secure. This is one of the vulnerabilities which is an exception to that. There are some other exceptions and most of those are denial of service. So there's actually a bunch of denial of service attacks within the listener that I can basically send a crafted packet to the listener and it'll crash the listener. The database stays up, I can't steal any data, but I can cause a denial of service attack. But again, this vulnerability allows me without any database sign on to basically start stealing data. And so how do I know it can allow me to steal data? So the next column here is <clears throat> confidentiality and integrity. So Oracle subscribes to an industry standard called the Common Vulnerability Scoring System. And so this is a way that all the soft, major software vendors rate security vulnerabilities. So this is used by Microsoft, Cisco, Oracle. And so it's a fairly standard. So you can read these across other companies' advisories and see kind of what the impact is. But again, confidentiality means I can read data. Integrity means I can write data. And then Oracle puts in partial or, or partial plus. Partial plus means I can read all data in the database. For integrity, partial plus means I can write any data in the database. I, again, these are very powerful vulnerabilities, so I can just compromise the entire database with just basically be able to connect to the network port. And then when you add this up, you could basically get a, a CVSS score of 7.5 out of 10. Again, that seems kind of low. If I can take over the entire database, why would it be a 7.5? Why wouldn't it be a 10? And the problem here is there's a flaw in CVSS that says, well, if I can take over the entire database, I can't get the root operating system account. And if I can get root, I can take over the entire device, that means a 10. But if I can only take over one piece of it, in this case, an Oracle database, it's only a 7.5. Um, in the newer advisories, if you read the most recent ones, such as July 2016 or April 2016, Oracle actually upgraded their version of CVSS to the most recent version, which just came out recently, and that actually is a little bit better. So you'll actually see Oracle security flaws, the base scores of them in the last few quarters actually uh, increased a little bit. So now this would be recalculated out in the most recent version of CVSS, which is 3.0, would have probably been a 9.1, so much more critical vulnerability. And then the last column here is this actually impacts all versions. So this vulnerability impacts all versions. Fortunately, 12C versions are protected by default, but I can turn that off. So 
there is a potential that a 12C version can still be vulnerable because there's under certain scenarios, people are turning this off, feature off and therefore making their database vulnerable. And then finally, the other key point here is this is not fixed by a CPU patch. So there is no SPU or PSU that fixes this vulnerability. This is a manually a vulnerability in 11.204 and prior that must be fixed by changing the listener.org configuration. So that's a little bit of high level background about the vulnerability. So how does this actually work? What is this attack and why is it so devastating to an Oracle database? The assumption here is I have an attacker, I am on your internal network and your network is flat. So I have to be able to see the database uh, IP port. So I have to know that it's on, there's a database running on that server. It's, it's, it's IP address, maybe port 1521. And I also have to know the SID. So in this case, our SID is prod. I do have to know that information. So if you do have network controls, if you're putting a firewall in front of your data center and blocking access from your entire network, which is Integrity's number one security recommendation for Oracle databases, you would be protected against this flaw, except if someone's it within the data center. So if I'm trying to limit access to the database by IP addresses, I can pretty much reduce the risk of this flaw. But if an attacker can get and actually see the IP address and the port of the database server, they can easily exploit this. There's no other protections. So basically, my attacker then downloads some software, and I'll actually show you this in real life and actually show you where, where I can you can download it. And he installs this little tool called TNS Proxy on his machine. He's on your network. And what the attacker does is then registers with the database and says, hey, I see your prod database. I want to be part of your cluster, and I want to load balance. And the Oracle databases say, hey, I am more than willing to have anybody come in and give you half my traffic. That if you want to load balance and be part of my production database and share it, that's no problem. And so basically the attacker is now registering the bad guy's IP address and saying, hey, give me half your traffic. Um, I'm, I'm also hosting your database for you, so just give me half the traffic. And so now what happens is when a user connects, they'll be load balanced, so it'll be, it's basically a round robin 50-50 type uh, <clears throat> load balancing. So in half the cases, now what happens is the user, instead of connecting to the database directly, will assume it's a cluster and the use the user, SQL Net apps, SQL Plus, SQL Developer, any application. And the user could be an application server, could be an ad hoc user, could be a reporting server, could be a DBA. It doesn't matter. It's just basically behind the scenes, low level SQL Net traffic flowing across the network, just saying, hey, I'm connecting to a database. And even in the case where an application server is sitting right next to the database server, it will still load balance to an attacker that's sitting out in your Chinese office. There is no oh, who's closest or anything like that in terms of this load balancing, it will just send 50% of the traffic across. And so now the user, in case maybe an application server, is at connecting to the attacker's machine through this TNS proxy. The TNS proxy then forwards the traffic off back off to the database. But in this case, the TNS proxy can sit there and just watch the traffic. It can capture it, it can look at it, and it can also inject traffic. So if my user in this case is a DBA with highly, a highly privileged account, the attacker can now add in SQL statements such as create a user, alter a user's password, um, do a select statement. And the user has no idea that this is happening because they just, they're, they, they're sending off a SQL statement. The TNS proxy is forwarding that SQL statement. Then it's getting the response back and it's sending the response back to the user. The user is, has, has no knowledge that somebody is in the middle here going through and just intercepting all the traffic and looking at it. So this becomes very powerful, especially because there's no indication from the user's perspective that there's anything wrong. There's no authentication here. The authentication is actually coming from the user's machine. So it becomes a very powerful attack. And if we now kind of put it all together here, as you can see, now we're just registering and just traffic is flowing across the network. The user has no idea. And the only limitation, there's two major limitations. One is I, the attacker has to be able to connect to the machine. So if you do have some IP res address restrictions in place, 
very positive move. You can basically stop this attack. And two is the attacker only sees half the traffic. The attacker would not see every single connection going into the database. He would only see uh, about 50% of them because of the way they're load balanced. But again, all I need is one connection from a privileged account. Most application accounts seem to be privileged. Uh, one DBA account, and then I basically can take over the entire database. So that's kind of uh, kind of an illustrated attack of the attack. So this information was published out. So in 2012, a very nice white paper. So if you just go to this URL, um, uh, Joaxon has all everything you need there to do this. Um, so I'll just quickly show you the website here. Um, so basically, this is his website, and so kind of the exploit code is right here. And he'll, he's done some nice jobs on some other products too. So if you want to see some other security vulnerabilities and basically you can just, anyone in your organization just, or an attacker can just basically sit here, click on and download this zip file, tnspoison.zip, and basically use this to make an attack against your Oracle databases. So again, there's not a lot of work here. This is for a fairly low level person could actually get this going. Probably not an AP clerk, but definitely any of your developers or anyone like that could easily exploit this. Anyone who's a dedicated attacker wants to, and knows your databases at all can basically exploit this fairly easily. So now if we kind of go through and say, okay, how is this working? So what's actually happening? So this is my database server and we'll actually go in. And so I've got an 11204 database running here. So I'll do a status. I've got my listener here. And this is just a classic listener control status statement. And as you, now you can see, I've got my listener running. It's running on port 1521. Um, and the database is registered with it. So here's my database server. My database is Aura 112. Um, so again, this is just the way Oracle works. So I've got, this is a single uh, database server environment. So this is not rack. So now I've gone through and downloaded um, those two programs, that zip file. And so the zip file has two components. First, it has my proxy here. So here's the case, and here's just the uh, command line. So again, it's, it runs in Python, so I just at least have to install Python on my machine. But I just downloaded that zip file, unzipped it, and it's got a, a nice command line, and it comes with a very nice PDF. Um, so it's very well documented out exactly what I need to do. And so I just sit here and now run this TNS proxy. So remember, we had a TNS proxy running on the attacker's machine. And so it'll just sit here and accept traffic. And so what it's doing is saying, okay, my local IP address here, 4.155, listen on port 1521. And my database is, is at 2.18 and the remote port is 1521. So it's just sitting here waiting for traffic to come in. Where the magic happens now is I've got a second Python script as part of the, again, as part of the zip file. And what this is, is saying is, okay, now for this one database, register this database. And now tell that remote database that, hey, using remote registration, that you've got another partner out there that's willing to accept your traffic. And so I'll just hit enter here. And now it's sending off these registration packets to the database. And now if I actually go back to my database, remember my listener command here, and it said service 112 got one instance running. So again, it's just a single node environment. But hey, if somebody wants to come in and join me, I will. We'll do a listener status command again here. And now look, now I have two instances running. So again, this is like a rack environment now that, hey, somebody else decided to come in and be real nice to me and decided to load balance my traffic. And that's kind of one way you can tell if you ever see this and you know it's not a rack environment, you know that this attack is happening. You can also look at the listener logs uh, to see what's happening. So now if we go actually out to SQL Developer, and so I've got my database here in SQL Developer. And we've got a proxy test one here. And so now if I actually go in and do, let's say, select name, password, I'm a DBA here, sys user dollar. Everything looks fine to me. It's working perfectly fine, correct? I'm not seeing anything different. This is exactly what I'm expecting it to work. I'm just connecting to my database, um, to the IP address and port number my DBA's told me. Now, if I go back and now look at what's happening here, 
And again, this is a little ugly. It's not the best looking, but as you can see, it's now dumping exactly what I'm seeing in terms of traffic. So here, select name, password, that's my SQL statement. And this is actually what's getting returned. So again, I'm just seeing that exact dump. In this case, I'm just seeing that here's username. I'll mark it here so you can see it. So again, within this, here's EXFS. Uh, sys, and then here's the password hash that got returned by that. So again, it's not the prettiest thing, but now I can also change the Python script slightly and actually inject any commands I want. So again, this is the attack. So really, I haven't done much. I've just downloaded a zip file. I know your IP address, port number, and SID, and I just had to put that little bit of information, and now I can actually capture this. No one would be any the wiser of what's actually happening here. Um, so again, that's why this is a very powerful attack because it's happening behind the scenes. It's a man in the middle attack in security parlance that nobody really knows what's going on, that something's passing through. And I have the full privileges here. I could have basically within my Python script, if I see a certain SQL statement come through, actually now execute another SQL statement. Um, knowing that maybe that's a DBA connection uh, coming in, I can actually do some things. Um, so if I just kind of go through here and go, we'll go back to SQL Developer, I'll just do another statement. Um, select username from DBA user. So again, this is, becomes very powerful in terms of just seeing any traffic I want. And again, the user has no clue what's happening here, uh, what's getting returned. And so again, we're just seeing the traffic flow by um, here and you're just seeing the different statements being executed. And again, now when I'm looking, going back and looking at my listener, I'm now seeing these kind of load balance sessions happening. And nobody's the wiser. And so now someone's compromised your database rem remotely, and it becomes a very powerful attack. So that's at a very high level, kind of just giving you a demonstration of why it's a problem, what are some of the issues. And again, all I've done is gone through and downloaded a zip file from the internet. Um, and this was a fresh install of 11.204. So by default, 11.204 is not secure. If I try to do the same thing with against a 12C database, by default, it will be protected. Um, so again, the exploit information is here, um, the URL. And so all I did was run these two Python scripts with a couple command line options, was able to do this very easily. Um, so the question is, how do you check if the database is vulnerable? Um, there's a couple different ways. Um, the easiest way is just look at your listener.ora file, and we'll, I'll give you the mitigation steps in a few minutes. Um, you're basically looking for those mitigation steps. Um, that's really the primary way. There's no tools directly released by Oracle that check for this. Um, Integrity's tool, AppSentry, will check for this and tell you if a database is vulnerable. Um, but using open source freeware tools, uh, the one we recommend is Nmap. So Nmap is a network scanning tool that you can actually scan for different IP addresses and port numbers and actually gather information. It's very powerful if you just want to check every device in your network, but it does have some Oracle-specific scripts. Um, so there is an add-on script, and I've included the URL here. So when we send out the PowerPoint tomorrow, uh, you'll be able to get the URL directly. But if you just Google Nmap Oracle TNS Poison, this pops up also. Um, so this is just a script out of the Nmap tool that can actually show you if a specific database is vulnerable. And the nice thing, and the reason we recommend Nmap is you can scan large numbers of databases very easily to see which ones are vulnerable by just putting in ranges of IP addresses. Um, so if I kind of skip back out to a command prompt, again, this is a command line tool, um, and I do have to download this uh, TNS poison script. But again, the Nmap command is fairly easy, and we've, I've given it to you there in the uh, PowerPoint presentation. And so basically you just put in the script name. Here I'm putting the port numbers uh, 1521, and then I'm putting in the actual IP address of my database server. And I could actually put in a range here. So if I know all my databases are running on 1521, I could then put slash 24, which would scan the entire uh, dot two block. And so it would scan all 255 addresses. I can put in ranges. So if I want to scan my entire data center and I know my databases are on a consistent range of port numbers, I can scan those all very easily. 
and now I run this and what this is doing is basically connecting to the database and actually trying to then register this as a different name so if it, it's allowed to be registered then it'll actually tell me if it's vulnerable or not um, so again it's connected here it's telling me port 1521 is open and it's identified it as an Oracle service and now basically it's saying Oracle TNS poison the host is vulnerable um, so again a fairly easy way and it'll tell you if it's not vulnerable so it says host is not vulnerable if it's not vulnerable so again this is a pretty easy way to check um, and identify if a server is vulnerable or not. Um, and this is kind of the best way without looking at the listener.aura file. Um, so this is actually a programmatically way that will actually go out and test it on the network versus checking. Um, so that's it. There's a couple other tools out there. Um, there's a tool called ODAT, O-D-A-T, um, which will also check for this. Um, but there are, not, in terms of like enterprise manager or anything like that, th none of those tools will check if this is vulnerable. Um, so you need a specialized security tool, something that, such as Integrity's App Sentry, Nmap, ODAT. Um, so there's a number of tools out there. So now the question is, how do I fix this? What is the different ways? So again, as I've said before, 12.1 is enabled by default to block this capability. So remote registration if you're running an Oracle 12C database blocks this by default. If you're running 11.204 or prior, there are a couple different ways to protect against this. Um, Oracle released as part of that April 2012 advisory and with the release of 12 or 11.204, they added a feature called valid node checking registration, so VNCR. And so VNCR is only available in 11.204 and 12C. Prior releases, then you actually have to do another method called cost, which is a class of secure transport, or start using SSL encryption with certificates. Um, and as you saw a couple years ago, Oracle released the networking encryption parts of ASO, all of a sudden became free. That was in conjunction with this security vulnerability. So previously, ASO, Advanced Security Option, was the SQL Net encryption capabilities, SSL encryption, as well as TDE. As part of this security release in April of 2012, Oracle decided to take SSL encryption and SQL Net encryption out of ASO as a licensed option and include it for free um, within different editions of the database. So ASO today is only transparent data encryption, TDE, and Oracle data redaction. Um, so you can implement SSL encryption with certificates, and that is the only option if you're doing 11.203 and prior. Again, if you, anyone's ever worked with SSL and having to do certificates, this is not an easy option. Um, if you're running 11.203 or before, we would definitely recommend using uh, cost, which still can, can potentially require some certificates set up. Um, but if you're running 11.204 or 12C, VNCR is definitely the way to go about it in terms of fixing this vulnerability. I've included the Metalink notes there, so I, I'll not talk much about cost. I'll mostly delve into VNCR um, because that's what we're seeing most of our clients implement it. Most people are moving to 11.204 at this point, uh, but for older versions of the database, really cost is the only uh, option here. So valid node checking, um, I've included the Metalink note here. A new option has been added to the listener.aura file starting, and again, this is starting with 11.204 only. And so you basically add in valid node checking registration, and you add in the listener name at the end, just like a lot of the other listener.aura parameters. And there's a couple of different settings. And so in the settings column here, it's very important to know that you can actually set these a couple different ways, and they're all equivalent settings. So in terms of it's either off or zero, on, local, or one are the same setting, and subnet or two are the same setting. So those are actually different settings. So if you set valid node checking registration equal to off or to zero, you'll actually get the same result. The key point here is VNCR for 11.204 is off by default. The early Metalink notes regarding this after the immediate release of 11.204, a number of Metalink notes were wrong, and they were saying it was enabled by default when it wasn't, and that was corrected. Uh, in the next June. So eight or nine months later, it was actually corrected in terms of all the Metalink notes. So 11.204 has never had this enabled by default, even though Metalink notes um, say that. Starting with 12.101, 
uh, VNCR is enabled by default and available. Um, and then finally, there's actually a third option is you can either set it to subnet too. So we recommend definitely setting it to on. Um, so if you have an 11.204 environment, uh, valid node checking registration should be set to on. So you do need to add that in where in 12.101 and 12.102, it is set to on by default and you don't need this parameter. Um, you can also set it to subnet, which will allow registration just from local machines on the subnet. That's the same subnet as the database server. Um, so if you do have a secure data center and you know that there's no other machines that can possibly be compromised on that subnet, that's an acceptable setting too. There are a few problems that we run into consistently with VNCR. Um, the first problem is the name of it is valid node checking registration underscore the listener name. So when we talk about this parameter, it is not just underscore listener. So if you go out on the on Google and Google valid node checking registration, you'll see a lot of examples out there, including some Oracle examples that list the parameter name as valid node checking registration underscore listener. The last part, underscore listener, is really underscore listener name. So if your listener is named listener, you're fine. It works. But if your listener name is named underscore is prod, you need valid node checking registration underscore prod. And so we run into quite often that people just put in, yeah, well, we're, we're fixed. We put in valid node checking registration listener. And as an example, Oracle Business Suite, when they set it up, Basically, the listeners are named after the database instance. So if your database instance is named prod, your listener name will be prod. It will not be listener. Therefore, you would have to have valid node checking registration underscore uh, prod set. And we catch a lot of organizations who think they've corrected this, but it's really not corrected because um, they're doing that. Um, the other one we see quite often is they just put in valid node checking registration. It has to have the listener name. So if I put valid node checking registration equals on, that's not good enough. That won't work. Um, it'll just ignore the parameter. And then finally, in 12C, this is secure by default. So the out-of-the-box setting for valid node checking registration is on. However, even if you go through some MetaLink notes, if you go, if you Google and start looking at clusterware and rack implementations, you actually have people who are suggesting to turn this off because they're having problems. As soon as you get a problem, what does the DBA do? Okay, I'll just turn that off. Okay, it worked. I can move on to something else. And they don't realize that they've opened a nice security flaw and major hole in their Oracle database. So again, even if you're running 12C, you need to be checking this value because we are seeing it maybe 10 or 20% of the Oracle 12C environments we're checking. We're, it's, a, it's a large number, much larger than we would think for a default parameter that's a security parameter that shouldn't be changed. Uh, but again, people are running it, especially in large rack environments that they're trying to set things up. Um, and there's a few other scenarios on some backup situations um, and some failover situations where, okay, you're trying to make it work and you don't quite know the IP addresses and things like that. So the first thing you do is you set valid no checking registration equals off. Everything seems to work and you're fine and dandy. But again, you've opened up a nice security hole. So again, every environment should be checking for this flaw, even if they're 12C. So if you do have a rack environment and you do need to have registrations from different nodes, you do then have another option called registration invited nodes. Again, this is listener name. So if you set this up as just registration invited nodes or registration invited nodes underscore listener and your listener name is something else, it won't work. So again, now you're adding in a list of IP addresses. And the very nice feature here, in comparison to the standard invited nodes, which just limits IP uh, connections to the database in general, you can use wildcards on this. So you can use um, CIDR notation, which says I can do subnets. I can also put wildcards in for the different values. So this is a little bit better and easier to use than just the standard invited nodes capability. Um, but again, it has to be set up correctly and it's with the listener name. So we do see that mistake quite often. I won't go into the uh, cost class of secure transport, um, but at a very high level, here's the two MetaLink notes. So this VNCR does not work for 11.203 and prior. So if you do need to have some older versions, again, 11.203 and prior are not supported, but if you're still running some of those older database versions, 10.203 through 11.204, you need to set up cost class of secure transport. And cost is a little bit more 
problematic to set up. There's a lot more setup steps. Um, VNCR is very easy to set up, very fun, very capable with one or two lines. Um, cost, especially in a rack environment, takes a little bit more effort. There is these two Metalink notes, and both of these are about uh, five to 10 pages long. So these are kind of bigger Metalink notes and takes a little bit more time to get through. Um, so that was at a very high level, um, just going through, looking at the different options, why this is a vulnerability, and basically the methods to correct it, a couple ways to look at to see if you actually have it in your environment. And we are seeing this quite often in a lot of our assessments that, especially in 11.204 and prior, that is not being corrected. And even in some 12C environments, it's not being fixed. And it, as we saw, you can basically, it's a very powerful exploit that I can basically connect to the database and to start stealing your data by just being on the network. Um, there, there are a couple limitations there in terms of IP address restrictions and things like that, but if you have a flat network and everybody in your organization can connect to the IP address, which in our experience is most organizations, the minority are blocking access to Oracle databases, but most allow from any desktop a connection to the database. Therefore, you can very easily exploit this by just downloading a zip file from the internet and following two pages of instructions and without anyone really knowing, I can see this. So I'll open up to some questions here. Um, hopefully this was helpful and provided a, a good level of value. And we've got a number of questions here, so let's get started. Um, would this vulnerability be rated as critical because of remotely exploitable without authentication? Uh, yes, we would rate this vulnerability as highly critical. This is one of those that there's a, just a couple of these. There's basically two in the last since 2005 that allowed this level of capability to basically take over a database without any authentication. So, and it's very easy to exploit. I saw you. I just showed you how to exploit it without doing. This is not rocket science. This is pretty easy, and the instructions are very clear. Um, I set the, this demo up within about five minutes. I've done it before, but within five minutes, I had this up and running with no problem. Um, it was very simple to do and very effective. So yes, this would be rated as a highly critical vulnerability. Um, we also, in, at Integrity, we rate basically any vulnerability that allows public permissions is also either high or very critical. Um, where because a lot of vulnerabilities in the Oracle database, I can connect, and as long as I just have public permissions, again, create session is all I need, I can also take over the database. Uh, but this shows why typically you want to protect your databases, and by protecting it at an IP address level and trying to prevent people from even connecting to the database, that's a very secure option here. That's a very effective way to block a lot of Oracle security vulnerabilities. Um, so how can we find Metalink notes that recommend it be disabled? Uh, basically, if you just search for the valid note checking registration um, option within Metalink, um, some of them will pick up. Uh, we've sent some notes off to Oracle trying to get some of those corrected over time. I'm not, I haven't looked recently to see how many of those are still there. Um, but again, our, our recommendation is always just check, be checking databases periodically. Um, you need to be scanning your databases to look for things like default passwords, missing security patches, misconfigurations. We would view this as a misconfiguration. So unless you're constantly checking your environment, at least on a quarterly basis, if not more, um, we'd like to see weekly or monthly. These are the type of things that just happen over time. It's very hard to audit every database on a, period, on a regular basis. So unless you're using some sort of automated fashion to go through and look at your databases, it's very hard to know when these things are introduced, especially when any new database is installed, that if you've got a junior DBA installing 11.204, they'll probably miss this. This is not one of those things that pops up on their radar screen. Um, as another example, popping up on your radar screen is when you're upgrading a database or installing a new, new database, you always have to be applying security patches at the same time. Um, so then this is one more step. Um, so you have to apply, install the database, upgrade a database, make sure that this is also being done at the same time. Uh, next question, valid no checking registration listener name um, is in the 12.1 documentation, so now it's clear. Uh, yes, so this has been in the documentation uh, for, for a long time, especially on 12C. It's also been in the updated 11.204. The, 
The problem with the documentation going back in time was 11204 was misrepresented uh, for a period of time, for about a year, 11204 that it was by default turned off, that it needed to be enabled was not in the documentation. Um, so the question is, um, it's very, it's fairly well documented, fairly well documented within the Oracle documentation, especially on 12C that came out by default secure. Um, is there a query to see the status within 12C? This is one of those parameters and options that you cannot see from the database. So you do have to check the listener configuration um, to see if this is actually enabled or not. This is purely just a parameter within the listener.ora file configuration. Um, so there is no automated way to do this without actually connecting to the listener and, and trying to ex actually re do a registration. Um, that's the only way you can make this work. Um, it would be very nice if there was some automated method to actually connect to the database, do a SQL query, just like you're doing hopefully for checking initialization parameters and things like that. Um, but unfortunately, this is one of those harder ones to validate. Um, so as an example, our uh, tool App Sentry actually does connect to the database listener. And we're checking about 10 things when we're doing this, and this is just one of them. But we'll actually check and try to register uh, a name that's not used. And if that registration is successful, um, then we know it's vulnerable. Um, so that's you know, really the only effective way to do it. So there is no easy way to check this within a large number of databases except for running tools like Nmap. And that's the reason we recommend Nmap is because you can very quickly scan a network as long as your databases are using at least a consistent naming. We do recommend that you change from 1521, um, but use a consistent naming across the different or port numbering for the databases. So let's say you use the range within 8,000s or something or 9,000s, at least you can scan your databases fairly quickly and fairly readily. Um, so next question is, would you still recommend changing the default port with uh, VNCR enabled? This is always one of those interesting ones within the security world. So within security, there's a concept called security through obscurity. And how much value do you get out of something? Should you just obscure it and really is it more secure? Changing the port number would be by a lot of security professionals just deem something, oh, security through obscurity, it doesn't provide you a lot of value. The reason we actually like to change the port number from 1521, because it just gets rid of the low hanging fruit within an Oracle database attack. So an attacker knows Oracle databases run on 1521. So if I sneak into your office, sit down at your conference room, plug into your network, and I wanna attack some Oracle databases, I'm gonna go after port 1521. And any automated tool, and there's actually a lot of security tools out there that actually just assume Oracle databases are running on 1521. And if you change it from 1521 to even any other number, and we even prefer being out the outside of the 1500s range, then you're just kind of getting rid of that low hanging fruit, that noise, that background noise. Yes, if an, a dedicated attacker is going to come after you, they're going to be looking for things like TNS names, aura files on your network. They're going to be scanning large numbers of port numbers. So there's lots of other ways to find it. But if there's just a low-hanging, quick attack, they're going to go after 1521. So if you change the port number, you're getting additional benefit there. Um, changing the port number alone is not sufficient at all. Again, you need to enable VNCR to basically fix this problem. Um, but ch change the port number, again, is just a general recommendation we like to make. Does it provide you a ton of benefit? No. Does it get rid of the low-hanging noise? Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's really some automated tools that somebody just downloaded from the internet and tried them. They all default to 1521. Um, very seldom do they default to anything else or even check, because even in all, all our tools, we automatically check 1521 through 1545. Um, because we know most organizations are at least using that range and we actually have a very high hit rate so when we do our uh, red team penetration tests that we sneak into your office we sit down in your network what are we, what's the first thing we're going to do well we're going to scan 1521 through 1545 um, then if we don't find anything or we don't find enough databases then we're, we actually start looking for tns names or our files and kind of take it to the next level uh, look for things that we can be uh, indicate where your databases are but again, our first step without any knowledge is going to scan your network for 1521 through 1545. So anytime you change that port number, it will be effective. 
Uh, that's it for the questions today. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Hopefully this was helpful and you can go back to your organizations and look for some uh, vulnerable databases. Uh, most likely we believe you'll find a few because we are finding them quite often during our security assessments. Uh, feel free to reach us at any time. Here's our contact information. Um, we are more than willing to answer questions or provide assistance in any way. And then finally, uh, we'll be sending out an email tomorrow afternoon uh, with a link to uh, the webinar uh, recording and the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, again, thank you for your time today and have a great day.